evening, everyone, and welcome to Thursday Night Live. Uh, we are streaming tonight on Twitch, YouTube, Facebook, and we're trying it out on Instagram. We got an Instagram camera over here, so we're going to be talking to everybody tonight. Uh, we got some great questions that have come in throughout the week, and I want to jump right into those. But if any of you who are watching today, either over there on Instagram or over here on uh, Facebook, Twitch, or YouTube, if you have any questions, be sure to drop them in and I'll pick those up as uh, well. We do this every Thursday night at 7 p.m. for those watching on uh, uh, over here on the Instagram channel. Uh, again, this is the first time we've ever done this over on Instagram. So if you want to catch our weekly uh, shows, jump on over to our YouTube channel or over to our Facebook group. And uh, you can even find some archives of past shows as well. So the first question that's come in tonight is from Shay. And Shay asks, what should I be moving to place my voice? So uh, this is a good question. We get a lot of forward placement questions or questions about placement in general. So let's dive in a little bit to what's actually happening when we get placement sensations. And to do that, I'm going to grab one of my many models over here because I always think it's helpful for all of you all to see what we're talking about and not just hear what we're talking about. So here is a life-size anatomical model of the head. And people feel vibratory sensations in different places. When they're singing, sometimes they'll say they feel them up in their forehead or they'll say they feel them in their cheekbones, or they say they'll feel them in their nose. And what does that really mean? Or what's creating that is really the question we need to address first before we then talk about what you need to move in order to place your voice. Sound starts down here at the vocal fold level, okay? And when the vocal folds vibrate, they create a buzzy sensation. It's a uh, kind of quality. And when that quality that's uh, created by the vocal folds is sent through the vocal tract is when we can shape it into different sounds. And I can demo that a little bit by just getting a buzz going and moving my vowels around. So it would be, uh, all those shifts that I'm making with my mouth are flavoring essentially the buzz that's being created by the vocal folds themselves. So as sound comes up from the vocal folds, it travels through what's called the epiglottis, which is right here, this area epiglottic sphincter. And it travels up through the back of what we call the pharynx over the hump of the tongue and out through the mouth. Now, in this model, the soft palate is down. It's this little thing right here. If you look in a mirror, it's the dangly little thing swinging in the back of your throat. That's your uh, soft palate, your uvula. Uh, and when the uvula is down, the soft palate is relaxed. Sound can escape up into the nasal cavity. Okay, so that's kind of like you're doing an NG sound. If you're going, mm, and then sound is escaping directly into the nasal cavity. We usually don't want that in singing, so we usually try to get the soft palate up and out of the way more of an ah quality. So let's assume that's what happens is this soft palate lifts out of the way. Well, some of those buzzies that are coming off of the vocal folds, they're going to ricochet up through your mouth and they're going to hit this bone that's on the roof of your mouth. So if you run your tongue across the roof of your mouth, you're going to feel that it's hard in the front and then it's soft in the back. Okay. So that hard part that you're feeling, that's called the hard palate. And the hard palate is actually connected to the rest of your skull. So here's one of my other models, a skull model. And you'll see that this is the hard palate right here on the roof of your mouth. And if you notice, as I tilt this around, that hard palate connects right here into your cheekbone. It's all the same bone. So when we feel vibrations in our cheekbone, it's because vibrations that are traveling through the vocal tract are exciting that hard palate and the sound ricochets up. Now, if you look on the inside of the nose or inside of the skull, you'll see here that there is the roof of the mouth and there's a bone right there, right inside of the nose. And that bone goes right up into this area where it could ricochet sound all the way up into the front of your forehead or into your nose. You can see it from the front that that little bone travels right up from the hard palate into the bridge of the nose, right? Hard palate to the bridge of the nose. And when sound vibrates that bone and sends it up here, then you may experience your voice as having ringy sensations or frontal vibrations in the bridge of your nose. Now, everyone is going to feel these a little differently, all right? So a lot of it has to do with your own personal anatomy. And that's why it's really hard, Shay, for me to tell you where to place your voice. You see, our voices all end up in different places based off of the, you know, uh, uh, the shape of our uh, vowel quality that we're making and what the vibratory mechanism is that we're at the vocal fold level, okay? And some singers don't feel any sensations at all. I've got several in my studios right now that just don't feel any vibratory sensations in their skull when they're singing. That's normal. And so we have to then look for instead, kind of what you said, is to move things around until you find the place that your voice 
uh, vibrates, if it does at all, when you get a tone quality that you like. See, that's the key as well. When I'm teaching, I'm not trying to make people have any predetermined tonal quality. There's not like, you know, I don't have everybody have the same ah quality. I'm listening to each individual singer and figuring out, hey, when your voice is free, that's the ah you naturally make. And uh, if that's the ah that you're making, what does that feel like to you? And then when they tell me what it feels like to them, I'm going to say, great, then keep repeating that. Now, some of my singers, when they get an ah valve, it sounds great. It's got a lot of power. It hits the note right. We'll say they feel vibratory sensations here. Some will say they feel it coming out of the back of their head. Some will say the bridge in their nose. Some will say the cheeks. Some will say right here behind their upper teeth. And others will tell me they don't feel anything. Right. And so that's always what makes our job interesting as teachers is we got to work with each student and what they feel or don't feel. So the question that Shay's asking is actually a good one is what do I need to move to make that happen? And the answer is the vocal tract, because it's the vocal tract that amplifies the frequencies necessary to cause you to uh, get vibrations that are picked up by the bone that might ricochet into different parts of your skull. Those parts of the voice are basically everything above the vocal folds themselves. So the pharynx down here, the oropharynx, which is the mouth part, and then all of this space between the tongue and the roof of the mouth and the opening of the lips. Those are all the things that you want to be able to move. How do we move them? Well, the easiest way is through vowel quality. The first thing to do is to make sure that you have the right amount of buzz that you want at the vocal fold level, what we would call the right registration. So if you want to have a buzzy sound when you're singing, you need to have some buzz in the registration and ah quality. If you have an ah quality, you're not going to be able to get any vibratory sensations in the front. You don't have enough what we call harmonics leaving the vocal folds to even feel anything. So you want to make sure that you're singing like you speak with some good firm vocal fold closure, that ah quality. Then you can get your larynx to feel like it moves up and down by playing with variations of an ah sound or an uh sound behind the hump of your tongue. Ah is going to have my larynx going high. Ah uh is going to have my larynx going low. So if I want a worn sound, I'm going to feel that ah uh feeling in the back. If I want a bright sound, I'm going to want that ah feeling in the back. Then in front of the hump of the tongue, what I'm going to do is figure out how to get the vowel quality by moving my tongue in my lips. So in uh, th that example, I'm going to then start trying to take that ah and then move the front to bring in the ah quality. But if I start with ah and bring in ah, I'll get a warm variation of ah. Ah, 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 ah. Now let's say I want a brighter quality. I could start with ah in the back, ah, and then get on the front, ah, 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 ah. So I could get up into those rock and roll tones if I have ah in the back and ah in the front. Or I can get up into those operatic tones if I have ah in the back and then put the on ah front. Now, when I make those vowel sound changes, thinking about what's in the back, is it more uh, is it more ah, and then getting the actual vocal quality or the vowel quality on the front by moving my lips and my tongue, I am then going to shift which frequencies get vibrated. When I have that ah, uh, ah, uh, I've got a lot of the lower frequencies vibrating, and so the vibratory sensations I get are going to be different than when I amplify the high frequencies by putting ah, ah. When I get that sound, I do feel vibratory sensations there. Ah, because the vowel is so bright. The bright vowel is really ringing that bone, so I feel sounds up here in my cheekbones and a little bit of my nose. But when I shift towards the ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh, I only feel a little bit of vibration right there. I don't feel it as much as my cheeks. So, ah, 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 ah. Shifting that vowel is enough to shift those sensations. Then what you can do is put your hand like this and imagine that this is the ah quality of the ah, and this is the oh uh quality of the ah, and move between the two. So it's going to be like this. Ah, that took me through all the different shades that exist between that ah and the uh quality. Then I can go backwards. Ah, 
So when it's really bright and it's really like that, that might be more of like my rock and roll sound, right? We both lie silently still in the dead of the night. And if I want to have more of a musical theater sound, it's going to drift down a little bit like this. Here's a couple of things I've learned on the many roads I've taken. Now, if I want to sing something from like Carousel, I might want to warm it up a little bit too. If I loved you time and again, I would try to say. So that's more of a middle ground. And if I run it to be really operatic, I'm going to go all the way into the ah. If I loved you time and again, I would try to say. That's bringing in that ah uh quality underneath of it. Okay? So Shay, what I want you to do is define your ah uh in the back of your vocal tract and your ah uh in the back of your vocal tract and then play around with all the different vowels. So we could even do it with E. I could have ah, e, e, and get that hootie operatic quality, or I could get ah, e, e, and get a bright quality. I could do it with O. Ah, oh, ah, oh. Playing with the back and the front, combining them together, to get the sound I'm looking for. And when I get the sound I'm looking for, identify within my own body where I feel those vibratory sensations. Are they here in my forehead or are they in my nose or are they in my cheeks? And then the key thing, Shay, is to then say to yourself, I, not that I place my sound in my nose, but when I get the right vowel combination on any given note, I might feel that sound in my nose because that kind of vowel quality does activate nasal vibrations. And if you make that your focus, when you're playing around trying to figure out placement, you're gonna be in a much better spot than if you just choose a placement and say, I'm gonna put my voice in my nose and just try to squeeze everything in your vocal tract until you get to that place. Because for many singers, that just leads to nothing but tension. And uh, we end up spending months or sometimes even years trying to get that tension to go away, okay? So placement is a great thing when it works for you and when it doesn't work for you, that's fine. Focus on vowel quality is a way of getting there. So the next question comes in from our friend Darren down in Australia. Uh, he asks us, I'm going to tilt this down just a little bit. So my head's above the questions tonight. There we go. But he says, uh, Darren says, since mixed voice relies on both resonance and vocal fold function, can you mix on a hum or an SOVT? So if you're new to the show and watching an SOVT is a semi-occluded vocal tract exercise. Now that can be lots of things. That can be lip trills. <laughs> That can be humming, can be NG, can be a blowfish, or it could be singing through a straw. So semi-occluded means partially closed. And vocal tract, uh, semi-occluded vocal tract, it's because when you occlude the vocal tract, which is everything above the vocal folds, and you pull that together, it changes the way that air and sound moves between your lips and your vocal folds. And that actually does have an impact on the vocal folds themselves. So this is a little bit of an advanced concept. If any of you are watching and you uh, haven't heard us talk about this before and you start to get a little lost, that's okay. It might help you to go back into our archives and check out some of the earlier talks about uh, registration as well as vowel quality because it really does make a big difference. And uh, it's great to see a lot of faces here. I see people I know have shows tonight. John has got a show tonight, and I know Drew has got to be having a show somewhere tonight. So it's great to see so many people popping in. Hey, everybody over on Instagram. Uh, for the Facebook audience, we're uh, dual streaming to Instagram tonight. So I've got like two screens rolling here. Hey, Dorian, another familiar face. Great to see you all tonight. Um, so with mixed voice, yeah, you're right, Darren, that the resonance does play a role in all of this. But I think that when at voice conferences we're talking about the co combination of these things we're also talking about it in kind of an idea that there are set variations of sound that we classify as mix or that we classify as belt or we classify as head voice and that's helpful in like the musical theater world and the choral world and even in the classical world to be able to have those classifications but as musical theater continues to evolve and of course commercial music has been evolving since its or uh you know origination with the blues and with uh jazz music uh, it's always been changing and unique voices are what sell. So when we start talking about um, mix, that's where we get in the weeds because what one person's mix is, is going to be different than another person's mix, which could be different than another person's mix. So when we're doing these SOVT exercises and we're trying to get the vocal folds and the resonance to merge, 
um, there's going to be quite a lot of variation. So in general, the short answer is, is yes, you can mix on a hum, you can mix on any kind of an SOVT. It just depends what kind of mix you're going for. And this kind of builds off of what we were just doing with uh, uh, Shay's question. I'm thinking about a uh, or at ah in the back and then the vowel on the front. But you can do that same stuff when you hum. I can have an a uh feeling in the back and then hum. Mm -hmm. That's going to give me one kind of mix. And it's going to be a mix that's going to fit more of that warm, acoustically projected place. Now, I could have more ah in the back of my SOVT or my hum. Mm -hmm. And that ah is going to give me a brighter quality. And that's going to be more in that world of commercial uh, or musical theater mix. Okay. So, yes, you can hum doing mm -hmm. You can hum doing mm -hmm. And you can hum doing mm -hmm. Those are all different resonance variations with vocal folds still in a more closed uh, phase that give us what we could classify as mix. And yes, you can do that through a straw as well. I can have more ah in the back. Ah. Or I can get more uh in the back. Ah. And uh, that's, you know, with the straw phonation, we like to think that it fixes all problems. But people still figure out how to let that larynx ride high or how to depress their larynx and still get the straw to work. So sometimes people's resonance adjustments can overpower what the SOVT is supposed to be doing. So that's why, you know, if you're struggling with straw phonation, working with the teacher can really help. So getting back to this uh, uh, question that Darren's asking, is that those resonance adjustments that we make are definitely going to have an impact on the vocal folds. And so we're going to have to navigate that along the way, making sure that we're picking the right vowel for the sort of uh, quality that we want. And that's where then we really get into those vocal tract, uh, vocal source interactions. If I'm trying to get a bright ah, and I've got a nice setup at the vocal fold level, ah, but then I've got a really hooty vowel, that's going to start feeling like it's kind of heady it's not the vocal folds are coming together but it feels heady because that vowel quality is shutting off all those upper frequencies but if i change that vowel towards more of an ah once that vowel starts to modify and amplify higher frequencies, we get a sound quality that we more commonly identify with mix. So yeah, these interactions matter, but you can get a wide variety of those interactions when you're doing SOVT exercises. So what I would say is try to give some cues to the person who's doing their hums or doing their straw phonation about which direction on that spectrum you want them to go towards. Is it more towards the ah? part of the spectrum is more towards the uh part of the spectrum. And you can do that even by just using terms like bass and treble by saying things to your client or if you're a singer and you're doing this on your own, it's thinking, I want this sound when I do my humming to have more bass in it, more mids in it or more treble in it. So a hum with more bass, mm -hmm, that can still be a mix. It's just a really dark, warm one. I could go up towards more cranking up the mids. Mm -hmm. And that is still a mix. It's a little bit more in line with what we would expect in contemporary commercial music. Or I could go with a lot of treble in it. Mm -hmm. That is also a mix. It's just a really thin one with a really bright vowel that has a really high larynx in it. Okay. So then we have to use that nudging to find what's ideal for the genre that the student is singing or for what their tonal goal is. If they like a more speech-like sound, we're probably going towards where the mids are turned up. Uh, if they're a classical singer and they want a sound that blends really well with the cellos and the violas and the orchestra, they're going to go for more of that uh influenced quality. And if they're going for something that's got a brighter instrument, especially like an electric guitar, that's when they're going to go for more of that ah uh quality inside of it. So uh, Darren, I hope that helps a little bit that yes, you can play with different variations uh, of uh, vowel quality and vocal fold closure on any SOVT exercise. It's going to give you a variety of different qualities of mix, but in today's world, that's what we're actually looking for is a variety of different qualities of mix. 
and not just one fixed quality of mix. And hi, Grace. Good to see you. So it's fun over on the Instagram. I got a bunch of former uh, clients that are popping up. It's really cool to see everybody saying hi. So uh, thanks for checking it out, everybody over there on Instagram. If you're just tuning in, we're on Instagram tonight, but we're also on Facebook Live and on YouTube Live and also over on Twitch. Just look up Voice Lessons app on uh, your favorite streaming service and you should be able to find us. You're also going to find over on our YouTube channel and our Facebook channel. We have archives of past uh, of the you know past episodes. So you're going to be able to go back and look for any information you may have missed or if you want to kind of see what we've done in the past. We've been doing these for almost two years. So we have, uh, you know, hours and hours and hours of content for you to check out. Hi, Cindy. It's great having everybody stop by. So uh, let's go on over here to the question. Next question from Diana. And Diana says, what's the secret to singing high notes softly? And I thought that this was a good, really good question. Mitchell, hey, thanks for stopping by. Another great voice teacher. Uh, <clears throat> it's always fun to see fellow teachers uh, stopping by our, uh, Friday, our Thursday night lives. I keep trying to convince myself it's Friday, but no, we all have work tomorrow, don't we? Um, well, tell Taylor I said hi as well. Love, Taylor. Um this is great. It's like a little reunion here as we're doing this tonight. So, uh, okay. So back to Diana's question. What's the secret to singing high notes softly? Airflow. The biggest mistake I watch people uh, doing when they're trying to sing high notes is they squeeze to try to get their voice to stay quiet instead of relaxing into the quiet and letting the air flow. Okay. So squeezing into it be, ah, you're trying to hold back your sound. And I see this a lot. And so I think that the problem is with that is that it's people who are still trying to place the voice while singing softly. And here's the thing. You can't. Remember, I just answered this when we were talking a little bit more about Shay, about what you move to get your voice to even feel any sensations of placement. And it's vowel quality. But I mentioned that the other component of it is you have to have enough vibrations that are coming off of the vocal folds. So I'm bringing it back out the head model. The vocal folds come from right here. They travel up through the vocal tract, and it's this bone up here that they would vibrate, and that's what we would make us feel placement. When you're singing soft, you're not creating enough frequencies from the vocal folds to create vibrations that will ring that bone. You're not even creating those frequencies. So if you're trying to place your voice while singing breathy, all you're doing is squeezing everything in your vocal tract to try to make that sound. Ah. Now, when you listen to recordings, you might be saying, but Matt, I hear they've got edge in their voice, and you're right because of the microphone. You see the microphone actually boosts the upper frequency range of the voice right where the forward placement zone is. And it can add five to seven decibels of power, which is actually quite significant. And when you add that five to seven decibels of power to the, the, the voice going through the system, it's gonna sound brighter. But that's not the only step. They still have an equalizer they can add into the mix where they can tune it up and add a little more brightness to the voice. Reverb has the opportunity to add brightness to the voice as well, plus the mastering effects that they layer on. So those breathy sounds that you're hearing on recordings that seem like they do have a little bit of buzz to them, oftentimes that's because of the microphone and the other recording technology that they're using, not because that's the way the singer is singing in the room. And that's really important to remember. Once you realize that, that even your favorite artists are singing with a lot more airflow and you start releasing air to sing softly, you're going to get better results. So instead of, ah, you're going to get, Ah, and it's going to make it easier to do things like rip. So instead of again, hey, where it feels really tight in your throat, you're going to release air. Hey, and you can go through that lick a lot faster, right? So it's going to even make things easier for you. You want to feel that you have exhale in the sound. So you can hold your palm in front of your mouth and then sing against it. Hey. If you're not feeling the warm air hitting your palm, hey, you're squeezing and holding, okay? So use your hand as a monitor to see if anything is actually flowing through the vocal folds. If it's not, what I want you to do is to start with a sigh. So feeling that you're going, ah, ah, ah. Going through your range, getting those high notes. Ah. With the airflow. Then slowly you can increase the sound. Hey, until you find a happy medium that works for your voice. All right. So, Diana, hopefully that helps out. If not, uh, reach out. Uh, just let us know if you want to follow up. And we'll be glad to take a listen to whatever it is you're doing and uh, give you some customized feedback. 
Uh, for everybody tuning in tonight, we do take live questions as well. So if you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the comment section over there on Instagram or in the chat section over on YouTube or on Facebook, uh, and we'll pick them up. We only got two more questions left tonight, one from T and one from Sam. T asks, is it easy to get nodules? In general, the answer is no. And let's we're going to put a better uh, uh, defining of what no means, right? So it's an easy, I guess, is really what we're defining is what's easy. Is easy going to the football game and screaming your head off? No. Going to a football game, screaming your head off is not likely to give you nodules. It could give you a hemorrhage vocal fold. That is where you burst a blood vessel on the surface of your vocal fold. And if you don't get that treated and you don't take good care of it, it could actually turn into a polyp, which could then cause a lesion on the other vocal fold that can end up looking similar to nodules where you have bumps on both sides of your vocal folds. So, yeah, something like that could happen from easily, you know, going and yelling. Uh, you could get in a fight with your significant other or fight with your parents and uh, you scream at them and you could hemorrhage a vocal fold. Uh, you can choke and hemorrhage a vocal fold. You can choke on a bit of food and trying to cough it up and hemorrhage one. And there is even a video from a laryngologist. The laryngologist was doing an exam on the patient. And the patient had a little bit of phlegm on their vocal folds and the laryngologist said, just clear your throat. And the, uh, the singer clears their throat and they hemorrhage a blood vessel on camera. So that kind of injury is really easy to get. Nodules are like calluses. And you know the calluses don't show up right away. You get a new pair of shoes that are a little bit too small. You're not going to get a callus that first day. You're going to get some wear and tear that's not going to feel good. Well, as a singer, if you get that wear and tear from a new song that doesn't feel good, most of the time you go, oh, that's not working because the sound's not right and you'll adjust. The problem is, is when you don't. So let's say you pick up a song that's got some high notes that are new to you and you're like, I'm going to get these by practicing every day until I get it right. And you go sing yourself hoarse every single day trying to get that high note. In that instance, yeah, you're going to have some problems. You're going to start building up an injury that could eventually develop these notches. It usually takes weeks or months before you get to that point. They usually start off small as little teeny bumps and then they start to grow over time. When they start showing up, a lot of singers will be able to tell by the sound. You're going to start losing the clarity in your voice. So what used to be, ah, let's try getting a little breathy or oh, rattly inside of it. Or it just won't come out. You go, ha, ah, ha, ah, and you'll have a huge hole in your voice. So those are the kinds of things that we're looking for. But here's the deal. That's not always a guarantee either. There are times that you're going to uh, have a voice that sounds absolutely great. It's doing everything that you want it to do. And then you go and get a scope and you're going to find out that you actually have something wrong with your vocal folds. And so, you know, we can't ever diagnose anything by sound alone. But in general, no, it's not easy to get nodules as in just like by an accident. You sing one night at a karaoke, you're not going to end up with nodules the next day. Um, trying to learn how to belt for the first time in a lesson with a teacher or on your own experimenting, you're not going to give yourself nodules the first time. You might blow your voice out, which could technically be a hemorrhage. So you got to be careful with that. Uh, we don't ever want to encourage any voice abuse, but sometimes, you know, you get excited and you belt a little bit too much. My biggest thing is, is if that describes you, if you got excited and belted a little bit too much, I don't want you freaking out thinking that you've done permanent damage and you have nodules and everything's over now. It's probably not the case. Now, if you keep going and doing the same thing day after day after day after day, and then, yeah, I'm going to be a little bit concerned about you developing nodules along the way. Okay. And there's one other thing that's just worth pointing out is that about one third of the general population has some sort of voice disorder. So if you hear about nodules or polyps or cysts or a vocal hemorrhage and you feel you know, a little bit worried about that, or you're scared about that, and you're thinking, oh my gosh, that'd be terrible to get an injury. I want you to know that it's common. One third of the people just walking around that you see any given day when you go to the Walmart or the Target or whatever you go shop, uh, one third of those people probably have some sort of a voice pathology. It could just be acid reflux, could be little teeny bumps. Uh, it can be lots of different things. So it is common to have a voice injury. And so singers should also realize that means it's common for them as well. And the statistics between uh, different genres, they're all real similar. Most of the time when you look at the stats, it's between 30 to 40 percent of the different singer types of populations that have uh, some sort of a vocal injury. And that's not really the difference between 33 and 40%. It's negligible, right? So all styles are at about the same kind of a risk factor because there's plenty of bad opera singing going on in classical singing, as well as plenty of bad belting going on. So we get bad things happening uh, in all genres. And we have people who are genuinely trying to get it right with their voice and their technique who still end up injured. 
So just like with athletes, it's not a big deal. You just got to get you recovered and then get you back on the field or in this case on the stage. And uh, you'll be able to keep going on singing for many years to come. That's as long as you though, consult a laryngologist, see a speech language pathologist and do the rehabilitation work necessary to get your voice back. All right. So our final question here for the night. Um, I see one other one that came in. We'll jump on that one as well. If you got questions, go ahead and pop them in. How do you sustain notes for a long time? This question comes from Sam. So practice. And uh, there's more to it because there is a kind of practice that you need to be doing. But essentially, your ability to sustain notes is going to uh, be uh, controlled by your respiratory system and its coordination with what we call the phonatory system or what how your vocal folds vibrate. Okay. And so when you're trying to sustain a note for a long time, you have to coordinate that respiratory system and the vocal folds. All right, you hit a note and you might hit it too loud and your respiratory system, your lungs collapse inwards, your abs contract, you get a big explosion of air, which kind of pushes your vocal folds out. And then you try to settle back into the tone that you want, but now you don't have a whole lot of air left in your lungs. So now you're squeezing and you're pushing and everything tightens up on you and you can't sustain the note as long as you want to, right? That's the kind of thing that happens when you lack coordination. So what we wanna to do to train you to sustain a note for a long time, Sam, is to teach you how to regulate that respiratory system over time. So there's a general rule that we can follow. And I say general because there's always exceptions to the rule. And the exceptions have to do with things like age, experience, somebody who's been singing for 15 years might do things a little bit differently than somebody who's been singing for 15 months, All right? That would be expected. Um, age is a big factor. As we get older, our respiratory capacity changes and our vocal folds thicken a little bit as well. So the way a 16-year-old is going to sustain a note is going to be different than the way that a 40-year-old is going to sustain a note as well. Okay. And of course, the genre. Uh, are you trying to straight tone this? Are you trying to get a vibrato going? Are you in a chest belt or are you in more of a, a head dominant kind of a classical sound? All those factors come into play. But in general, when you inhale and fill your lungs up with air, you have the maximum amount of air in your lungs at the end of a full inhale, which gives you the maximum amount of pressure. And when you have got all that pressurized air in your lungs, it wants to move to an area that has less pressure, which is the air outside of you. So that air, whether you like it or not, is going to try to get out of your body and go into the room. And as soon as you start singing, that's the opening for that sound to try to get out. Now, most of the time, we're, our lungs and our abdominal uh, uh, wall are all going to try to collapse inward. And that overpressurizes our lungs and it pushes too much air up onto the vocal folds. And that can end up being a problem. So the first thing we want to do is train the, your abdominal wall to relax and your rib cage to kind of stay up and out and only slowly return to its resting position. We don't want it to slam in and we don't want to try to hold it out too long because then you can create tension that's going to be bad. It needs to be buoyant. It needs to slowly come back in, but you don't want a fast collapse and you don't want tension on the holding it out. We're going to learn to do that just on a hiss. I'm going to back up just a little bit for the Facebook group and the Instagram group should be able to see me. We're going to breathe in and go. Then you're going to slowly let those ribs come in. At the same time, you're going to want to control the abdominal wall and relax it as well. It's going to slowly come back in. Now, when it's slowly coming back in on a sustained pitch, you're going to have to do a little bit of contraction. But the first thing we want to do before we deal with that is just get used to sustaining a pitch while trying to relax everything. So pick the comfortable pitch. We'll do it on ah. So again, we're going to get this to expand and then just keep it slowly coming back in. Ah. Then you can probably see a little bit. It's just starting to inch its way. It's very slowly. Now, when I got to that end of that note, I could tell I still had air in my lungs, but I couldn't really do anything with it if I was relaxing everything, right? If I was relaxing my abdominal wall and trying to keep my ribs out. And that's the moment where you're going to use abdominal contraction, where you're going to start to contract that abdominal wall. And it does two things. Your abs actually connect your pelvis to your rib cage. And so that means when you're contracting that, it's a lot like doing a crunch or a sit up and it's going to try to pull your rib cage towards your pelvis. And as those muscles uh, perform that action, it's going to compress the air in the lungs and help send it out. And that's how you're going to get that last little bit of air out of your respiratory system. 
It also, at the same time, compresses what's called the viscera. And you can see Patty LeBone back there. Down on the bottom, you can see her intestines and uh, the stomach that's under there, the liver's under there. And then you got to remember the diaphragm goes all along the bottom edge of the rib cage. And so when you're contracting that abdominal wall, you're squeezing that viscera and it pushes it up and into the diaphragm, which is also going to help you expel a little bit of air. So we're mm -hmm. going to start off with that sustain, keeping the rib cage out and the abs out. Ah, and we're going to do this as long as we can. And then when we feel like we need a little bit more air, we're going to start tucking the abdominal wall and pulling it in and in and in and in and in and in and in until you get to the end of whatever it is that you're trying to sustain. Now, the next key to answering this question, for those of you on Instagram, we're talking about how to sustain notes for a long time. Uh, this question comes from Sam. And so, Sam, that's the basis of how to do it. And what I want you to do is instead of trying to learn how to do it in the context of songs, I want you to learn to do it in exercises. Because this is the other big mistake I see singers make, is that they try to deal with sustained notes in rep or the songs that they're singing. And when they do that, they start getting a complex about those sustained notes. Every time they come up to one of those notes, they start thinking, oh, I don't know if I can get it today. And that note is forever locked in their mind as a problem spot. The alternative approach is to do it in exercises so your body begins to learn that it can do anything that it wants. And then when you come across the song, that you're just going to apply what you're doing every day in your practice. The easiest way to start with this exercise is just a one, three, five, eight pattern and you sustain the high note. Okay. So it's ma, 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 ma. Just going to hold it out as long as you can until you feel like you're almost out of air and then you're going to come back down the scale you're going to do that throughout your range now the lower you are in your range the longer you're going to be able to sustain that note and the higher up you are in your range the shorter you're going to sustain that so don't try to fight nature right we're not looking for immediate changes today we're looking for changes over three to six months okay you're going to see changes in weeks more than likely but I want you to not set your mind on this being done in two or three weeks. I want you to set your mind on getting really good at this over three to six months. Because if you take that timetable, then you're going to have this skill learned and you're going to be able to benefit from it for the rest of your life. And that's the last little thing I want to say with this is do not rush the process. So many times singers are trying to look for quick fixes. For some things, there are quick fixes, right? Sometimes I have a singer come in and they're going, ah, 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 and well, that's the back of their tongue that's retracting. And if you have them go, ah, they'll discover an unretracted sound for the first time in their life. And a lot of times they'll be able to make a change immediately. And two weeks later, you've already got the tongue out of the way. But that's a simple motor skill adjustment. What we're talking about here is a complex motor skill adjustment. Because when we're just doing the tongue thing, you're really just focusing on an ah vowel, which is open your mouth. Ah, stick your tongue out and your brain's only focusing on those two things and registering the difference. But in this exercise that we just talked about, your brain is trying to deal with the inhalation, the sustaining, uh, the expansion, and managing the collapse, then dealing with abdominal contraction, and then dealing with maintaining the vowel and register as well over a long period of time. Anytime we're taking on one of these more complex tasks, it's going to be a, a bigger learning curve for your brain. So give yourself a little bit of grace. Give yourself permission to take time to learn the skill and don't try to rush it. Most motor skills take at least six to eight weeks to really start taking root. And then it can really take three to six months for it to become an automatic thing that you no longer think about. So honor the process, take good care of your voice, and you should be able to sing for a lifetime. So let me double check here and see if we have any questions that came in. Um, uh, I see this Tamara asked. Let's see. Tamara said, is it possible to teach vibrato? Any extra suggestions for exercises? Yes, you can learn how to sing with vibrato. Vibrato comes from a relaxation of the entire instrument, okay? There's many different theories about what creates vibrato, and they're being, still being studied today. So what I'm going to tell you now is not the gospel truth um, as far as the only answer that I can say. Without a doubt, we're going to know that this is always how it is. We know without a doubt that there's two muscles that control what pitch you're on. It's the thyroarytenoid muscle and the cricothyroid muscle. It's not debatable. Everybody knows that's those two muscles are involved. There's other things involved as well, but those two are definitely part of the game. We believe with vibrato that your brain is sending electrical impulses to those two muscles, that thyroarytenoid muscle and the cricothyroid muscle. 
in something that's similar to alternating current. Okay, so if you have a battery, that's direct current. It's just one steady line of electricity. But with alternating current, there's a pulsation to the electricity as it flows through the line. We believe that your brain is sending a pulsated signal down to the muscles. And when your muscles are pulling in two different directions, that thyroid muscle trying to pull your vocal folds short and the cricothyroid muscle trying to pull it long, that as those muscles are working against each other, a little tremble starts to show up that the rest of the mechanism ends up uh, building up into a vibrato through the whole vocal tract and the resonance that's occurring. Now put your hands in front of you like this and pull in two different directions and you're going to feel that muscle vibration even showing up in your arms, right? Any muscle that you hold, you'll feel it as you contract and start to pulse a little bit. That's why we think that this is probably a big component to what creates vibrato. Now, the trick is, is that with a lot of singers, they end up compensating or using compensatory behaviors in their vocal tract to squeeze, to try to hold on to the sound, to either place it somewhere, to try to make it stronger, or uh, to try to otherwise affect the vocal tone. And they end up stifling the body's ability to let go enough to get that vibrato. Okay. And so when that happens, you have to then get all those things out of the way. So Tamara, the first thing I would start with are wobbles. Because the whole point of wobbles is to get your body to stop fighting the production of sound and just to let go. You can start off on something simple like a one, three, one, and we're going to just recklessly let our voice wobble back and forth. We're not trying to make a good tone. We're not trying to stay in the same register. We're just trying to get our brain to grasp the concept that it can let go of those compensatory muscles. Ah, let me take that up. to a fifth. Ah, 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 ah. And we're starting to feel things let go because you can't do that wobble while holding on. Ah, 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 ah. It hurts. It doesn't feel good. And it's not really a wobble. It's more of you just singing two notes. So I want you to first wobble. During that wobbling process, you might discover that your tongue's pulling back and you're getting, ah, 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 ah. Well, that's one of the reasons you probably don't have vibrato because the larynx needs to be free to have some pulsations and if your tongue is clamping up and pushing down it's stifling that from happening so when you're trying to do the wobble if you feel that tongue retracting you want to try to get it to let go ah, 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 ah. you might find that your jaw is tensing up ah, 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 ah. and it's hard to wobble if that's the case get the jaw out of the way ah, 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 ah. it's gonna be easier to wobble you might start to notice that your constrictor muscles are squeezing in and you're getting a little good, good sound in there. Uh, 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 and it doesn't work. Instead of a good, good, you want to feel some ha ha inside of there. And if you get that ha ha ha, ha ha ha, 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 ha you can get a better wobble. So you're going to use those wobbles to start trying to get any constrictions out of the way. And then I want you to deal with the vocal folds and make sure you're able to regulate how much air is traveling through them on any given note. You're going to pick a note and you're going to start breathy and you're going to build into a full tone. Then you're going to do the opposite. You're going to start in a full tone and go back to breathy. That's fine tuning the muscles inside of your larynx. You're going to need that for when you sustain the pitch because if you end up pushing too hard together, you're going to want to start to let a little bit more air out, like you're fading to a breath of your quality. Or if you start too breathy, you're going to want to kind of bring in a little bit of closure to find a better vibrational pattern somewhere in mix. Because it's in that mix area that for most singers, you're going to find the best setup to get a decent uh, vibrato. High soprano voices are different. There's still a mix quality to that. You still have to close those vocal folds. You can't just let them flop in the air. All right. But it's going to feel a little bit different in a soprano range than it is in like a, a lower uh, range around the tone middle C. Okay. After you've learned how to get those things moving, uh, the air moving along the way, you're going to then start trying to take a little teeny pitch change and then see if you can't let it to fall into vibrato. Uh, so it starts off as a half step. Uh, see if you can't then just settle that take that half step and start shrinking the amount of distance that you're traveling on that vibrato until it just falls into sync 
If you're struggling to find a falling in the sink, it probably means more than likely that you're pushing those vocal folds together. So add more exhale to it. If it's really breathy, you're also not going to get vibrato. So you're going to have to bring a little bit more closure, a little bit more edge into the sound. Then after you've done some of those little one, two, one things, see if you can't just initiate and then slowly relax everything until the vibrato shows up. And then start trying to take it up over uh, different intervals and trying to sustain it. So, and Tamara, go play with some of those things. Let us know how they work for you. And uh, just keep remembering, like I've said with a lot of things tonight, that it's a motor skill and motor skills take time to develop. So the first couple of times you do this, the most common reaction is, I can't do that. This is really hard. That's great. That means that you definitely are in what we call the cognitive stage of learning. And the cognitive stage of the learning is the first step in improving your voice. In that cognitive stage, you're having the realization that I don't know how to do this. This is kind of hard. At that moment, you have two choices. You can either choose to go, yeah, forget it. I'm not trying to go on with that. Or you can go, oh, well, then this must mean I'm in the cognitive stage of a new motor skill that's worth investing in to learn. And that's the route I would always encourage you to take. And when you start going down that pathway with this new motor skill, like I had said a little bit earlier in the show, you're going to have to give yourself at least six to eight weeks to start usually seeing things show up. Sometimes you'll get results in a little bit less time. But if you set in your mind, I'm going to at least do this for six to eight weeks, you're probably going to have better results unless you try to, and then if you try to force it to happen within a couple of days. Okay. So uh, hopefully that helps a little bit. If not, let us know. Um, this is a great question. Tyler said, I'm probably the only person who wants to see this, but is there a place to see that video of a hemorrhage caught on a stroboscopy? Yes. It's the Voice Foundation Annual Symposium Care for the Professional Voice. It's a conference that happens every uh, first weekend in June in Philadelphia. Um, unfortunately, that's the only place I've ever seen it because the doctor's office that has it, I don't think they put it up on social media and I have never been able to find it myself. But I will do you a favor tonight after the show and I will do a quick little search and see if I can't find it. And if I find it, I'll throw it here into the comment section. But unfortunately, I think the doctor that had uh, found that has just kind of kept it for use in uh, presentations, which is normal because of HIPAA compliance rules and things like that associated with medical care. So I want to thank everybody for joining in tonight. This is going to have to be the end of our show here this evening. But uh, thanks to all the Instagram viewers who have tuned in tonight for our first Instagram live feed. That's been great having you stop by. Wonderful to see a lot of familiar names and faces popping up on the screen. And to our Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch watchers, Thanks, as always, for tuning in. Don't forget, you can actually go back and watch some of the archive videos. Uh, so if you missed a past show, if you find this interesting and you want to try to go learn a little bit more, check those out. They're packed full of information. And if you find this approach to working with the voice really interesting, I want to encourage you all to check out my new online course, How the Voice Works. For those of you on Instagram, it's how-the-voice-works.com. Uh, sorry for all the dashes, but put them in there. You'll get there, howthevoiceworks.com. And uh, it's a special launch price right now. The price is going to be going up soon. We're about to launch a whole brand new website. There's going to be an exciting new app that's coming along with it. It's going to allow you to practice at home. Can't wait to release that to everybody. Super excited with what the developers are doing with that. And uh, it's going to really change your life if you don't understand how your voice works. Because the first step to making it work is understanding how it works in the first place. And I believe, and so does Mike Over, who's the CEO of VoiceLessons.com, who asked me to create this course. Uh, we all believe in making this information available at an affordable price so singers around the world can have access to the same information the pros get. So for a limited time, it's only $47. Four hours of 4K content shot in a studio in Hollywood. Uh, there's 100 pages of additional resources for reading, workbooks and stuff, uh, animations throughout. As some stroboscopy videos I walk you through so you understand what's actually happening in the vocal fold level. I give you guided listening examples where I take some famous artists and I talk to you about what they're doing functionally uh, throughout the whole thing. There's 150 exercise variations for you to work with and apply all the concepts to your own voice. So if you're interested, check that on out, howthevoiceworks.com. 
And now again, put in those dashes in between each word and you should be able to find it. And uh, again, be sure to check us out every Thursday night, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, and since we had a great turnout on Instagram, we might keep doing this. But if you ever uh, jump on and we're not on Instagram, just flip over to Facebook. Come on over to the Voice Lessons page on Facebook or jump on over onto our YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash voice lessons app. You'll be able to catch us. And again, check out those archives. Elizabeth, it's wonderful to see you tuning in tonight. Uh, thanks to everybody else who stopped by as well. And uh, we'll see you next week here on the voicelessons.com Thursday Night Live. Uh, we'll see you next week.